Someone came up just 15 minutes ago and said, you know, this is a really strange time. Uh, it's very disorienting. Well, hello, yes, 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 that's exactly what it is, very disorienting. So we have to kind of say that right at the beginning, uh, because I've never seen times like this in Washington, and I've been here, I've been in Washington, D.C., uh, 55 years. Um, I'm a chocoholic, and so when I heard that the best chocolate shop in Seattle was where we were this morning, I insisted we go back for some chocolate, and I bought some from the lady, and she said, well, now what are you talking about? She heard I was lecturing. I said, about Russiagate. And she said, oh, wow, those Russians. And I said, well, actually, what I'm going to say is that they're you know, there really is not very good evidence of Russian meddling. And uh, my colleague, Albert, said she paled and looked and said, oh, God, one of those Trump people. <laughs> so that having been said, and my wife's warnings ringing in my ears, always start, Ray, to try to explain to people that there is such a thing as objective intelligence analysis. Uh, that that's what you did for 27 years, and that you had no political agenda. You looked at the facts and you tried to figure out what they meant. And that's what you're doing now, okay? Now, it's so bad throughout the country uh, that when we wrote our key memorandum on Russian hacking, exact, well, not exactly, July 24th last year, uh, we had to start out with a disclaimer. I have the disclaimer here. Let me see if I can find it. I can't, but it, this is what it said. Um, it is odd that we need to say this, but intelligence analysts follow the evidence to where it leads. Anything we say or anything we write, uh, any resemblance to what presidents or pundits or politicians say is purely coincidental, okay? And I'll just add what my wife always asked me to say. Uh, my appraisal of President Trump is that he's the very worst president the United States ever had. That there are X number of reasons to indict him or to impeach him or to get rid of him. Not the least of which is the fact that Rita and I have nine grandchildren who will probably not have clean air and clean water to, to at their disposal when they get to be my age. How more serious can it be than that? I mean, what do you need to have before you impeach? You don't need made-up stuff, okay? You don't need made-up stuff. So, let me, let me just start and try to reconstruct how we got to where we are now. During the campaign in 2016, you'll remember that uh, Hillary Clinton was accusing uh, Donald Trump of being soft on Russia. He had this bizarre notion, I mean, like, hello. He had this bizarre notion that it would be a good idea to have a decent relationship with Russia. <laughs> oh, God, talk about crazy, huh? <laughs> well, Hillary and her people thought that this was something that would really resonate with the American people. Russia is bad, and uh, they would really make heyday by saying, look, Trump is soft on Russia. So they started doing that almost immediately, and then the, it hit the fan, literally speaking. June 12th, 2016, Julian Assange of WikiLeaks announces, we have emails related to Hillary Clinton, and we're just about to publish them. Whoa. Emails related to Hillary Clinton. This is the 12th of June. Oh my God, the, the Democratic Convention is just six weeks away. Oh my God, I wonder what they have. Well, they probably have, and we think that the DNC knew what had been stolen. Uh, they would have the emails showing, and this is no joke, folks, showing that Hillary Clinton stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders, pure and simple. Stacked the primary, stacked all kinds of stuff, all right? So, you know, before I forget to say it, and I hope nobody take offense, uh, if we have someone to blame for Donald Trump, you know, I mean, that's a bad, that's a pretty big onus, right, for, for Donald Trump. Uh, the Russians are, are, you know, easy to blame, 
But the, re the person responsible for us having Donald Trump is someone named Hillary Rodham Clinton. Now, she could not have lost the election because few people trusted her or Wall Street was in her camp or that she used an unclassified server for top secret information or that she didn't campaign in the right states, you know. It couldn't have been that. It had to be something else. It was the Russians. Now let me tell you how we got there. And let me just first say that this is so extraordinary. Now everyone expected Hillary to win, right? Everyone. Well, not everybody. A couple people had, were, were smart enough to realize that this wasn't a done deal. But everyone I talked to, uh, and you know, Julian Assange, uh, who I talked to three days before the election, said, you know, the Germans say it's eine, eine Wahl zwischen Pest und Cholera. Anybody know Germany? German? Okay. It's a choice between plague and cholera. <laughs> <laughs> And it was for me, that's why I was just delighted to be able to vote for Jill, uh, Jill Stein, okay? So what I'm saying here is that uh, most people expected Hillary to win. The New York Times uh, said she was a, a, a shoo-in. And everyone was operating out of that environment, including James Comey, John Brennan of the CIA, the NSA, and the Department of Justice, Loretta Lynch, and all those folks. Very high-level people, okay? Now, how do I know that? Well, you can reason to that by being an analyst, okay? But now I have documentary evidence in the form of James Comey saying, we were operating in an environment where we expected Hillary to win. Now, if you don't understand that, it's really hard for you to, to believe that our very top law enforcement officials and the Department of Justice as well as the FBI played fast and loose with the law to make sure Hillary would win and that Trump would lose. And the documentation is out there. You don't see it in the New York Times, but I'll expose you to some of it, okay? So if you don't realize that these people fully expected to keep their jobs, no small thing, fully expected to be rewarded rather than indicted by playing fast and loose with the law, then you don't understand how this thing, kind of thing could happen. And I've not seen the like of it since Watergate, and I was around for Watergate as well. So that by way of preference, uh, or preface to what we're going to say here. So on June 12th, Assange announces that he has emails related to Hillary Clinton, was his words, and he said that he's going to publish them soon. Two days later, CrowdStrike, the computer entity hired by the Clinton campaign, announces, we have seen an intrusion into the Democratic National Committee, and there are telltale signs in Cyrillic. Cyrillic, as most of you know, is Russian, right? Okay. As a matter of fact, we have the name of the first head of the Soviet secret police, his name and patronymic, Felix Ermundovich, which is uh, for Dzerzhinsky the first thing. So, so whoever intruded uh, into the DNC was either incredibly sloppy, and no one has accused the GRU, the, uh, the Russian intelligence, military intelligence service of being sloppy, or they were overly clever in leaving more than just telltale signs in Cyrillic, not leaving just, just a tablet or a Microsoft type format, but leaving so we wouldn't notice, I mean, so we wouldn't miss it, the name and patronymic Felix Simonovich. So that's January, that's June 14th, two days after, uh, after Julius Assange announces he's got these emails. January 15th, out of the ashes arises an entity, a persona, named Guccifer 2.0. Whoa. Who is Guccifer 2.0? We don't know. A year and one month ago, we asked the president to find out. Maybe he should ask the FBI. Who is this Guccifer 2.0 persona? We don't know if it's an 
entity or a man. We use non-sexist language uh, uh, pertaining to personas, so we don't say Guccifer he, we, Guccifer. We don't know. We still don't know who Guccifer is, but we do know that he's a fraud. He's an out-and-out out fraud. Now, how do we know that? Our veteran intelligence professionals for sanity group is blessed with all kinds of expertise, including two former directors, two former technical directors of the National Security Agency, huh? Bill Binney and Ed Loomis. Bill Binney has been around. You've seen some of the things that he said, and uh, they know they know that uh, Guccifer is, a, is an entity that uh, is fabricated. They know because they have some forensics that come out of metadata, metadata associated with these intrusions, and they've been manipulated. And so Guccifer 2.0, we still don't know who he, she, or it is, but we know Guccifer 2.0 is a fraud. And we can prove it. We have hard copy of the intrusions and Bill, has, Bill Binney has taken me through, so even a liberal arts guy like me can understand you can't have an accurate thing when you have interspersed, uh, intermingling of various uh, periods. So, what does that mean? Well, that means that these indictments of the 12 apostles, then the 12 apostles, the 12, <laughs> 12, 12 GRU people, GRU, the, the military intelligence arm of the Russian, well, they're all based on Guccifer 2.0. Well, hello. <laughs> what does that mean? It means it means that, uh, as my Russian teacher would say, it means uh, that you cannot be sure of, uh, of these conclusions. It means that Bob Mueller. Well, Bob Mueller enjoys an in, a, a reputation of being uh, universally respected. Uh, that is, if you use the, if you read the New York Times or the Washington Post. Now, Colleen Rowley, who worked in the FBI uh, during his tenure, and worked when James Comey was in the Department of Justice, uh, tells us all that you know James Comey, I mean uh, Bob Mueller, uh, falsified the intelligence before Iraq. Didn't say no to the torture. Approved the wiretapping, you know, that famous scene in the hospital. Well, the next day they approved the program. They just changed the name, okay? And Bob Mueller has been, you know, I had a personal encounter with Bob Mueller. I was at Georgetown University with 300 other people, and uh, uh, John Brennan uh, introduced his old friend, uh, Bob Mueller, who had just uh, retired from the FBI, and Mueller made some comments. I, they, any questions? So I raised my hand. So, okay. I do that, you know. So I said, "Now, uh, Mr. Mueller, uh, as a as a, a lawyer, do you have any do you have any legal qualms with um, uh, with the process called uh, 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 the process whereby you take sensitive information? Uh, it's called parallel construction." And for the benefit of the people there, I said, that means that you take illegally acquired information from NSA, you give it to the cops, and you say, look, go to this corner next Saturday night this time, and you get these guys, you prosecute them, and you put them in jail. Uh, you don't tell the judge. You don't tell the defense attorney where you got the information originally. And so you're perjuring. Perjury is involved at every stage of this. And... Uh, I was just wondering, Mr. Mueller, do you have any, any legal qualms about that? You know, there's a lot of murmuring. Was my old intelligence friends there. So Mueller looks at me. He's a big guy. He looks at Mr. McGovern. And he said, uh, after 9-11, we were given special authorities. Next question. <laughs> there you go, folks. After 9-11, uh, we were given special authorities. You know, you've heard endless times, you know, after 9-11, maybe you could uh, complete the sentence. After 9-11, everything changed. changed, right? And so this constitution, you know, this, this thing that, that I swore to support and defend, and I usually have in my back pocket there, um, it was sort of overtaken by 9-11. My God. 
and he was the head of the FBI at the time. Okay, so he was given special authorities. Now I, I said to Colleen Rowley, "You're a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. How do you figure this? I mean, how can you do illegal things just because you were given special authorities?" And she says, "Well, Ray, it's sort of complicated, but basically." Uh, it takes about a decade for the, for the judges, the courts to catch up, and then they say, oh no, this is illegal. But meanwhile, you do illegal things and you say you, would be, you had been given special authorities. Wow. So that's Mueller. <laughs> now, how did he get appointed? Well, you, you probably remember that when James Comey decided he would leak a personal conversation with the president, now, in my day, a personal conversation with the president was ipso facto classified. I mean, hello, that's a no-brainer. But he thought, well, he could make it unclassified. He gave it to a lawyer friend. They leaked it to the New York Times. And the story was that President Trump tried to get uh, Comey to go easy on General Flynn. What he said was, I hope you can you know, go easy on him, or some words to that effect. Ah, so, New York Times publishes that. Now, they asked James Comey, you know, it's a little, little irregular for FBI heads, present or former, to leak information. Why did you do that? And he said, oh, I wanted a special prosecutor named. And sure enough, the next day, a special prosecutor was named. His name was Bob Mueller. And James Comey said, thank you, Jesus, my best friend forever, Bob Mueller. Oh, man, this is going to be great. Hello. <laughs> That's how it happened, folks. Don't believe me. Believe what James Comey said. Now, with respect to Comey, while we're on the subject, uh, when it was revealed that, uh, or when it was claimed that the Russians hacked into the DNC, into the Democratic National Committee, do you remember what John McCain said? Act of war. It's an act of war. The Russians have done an act of war. Lots of people are saying this is an act of war, right? What did James Comey do, the head of the FBI? Anybody know? I was like the tar baby in Uncle Remus. You didn't say nothing. You didn't do nothing. Now, if you were the head of the FBI and you heard that the Russians had hacked into the DNC computers, what was the first thing you would do? <laughs> yeah, right. Seize the computers. Take a look at them. Send your forensic experts in there to seize the computers and find out what you know. How did this all happen? But some, for some reason or other, Comey didn't do that. And when he was asked softball questions by the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is a softball, uh, the archetype of a softball outfit. Now, Mr. Comey, uh, tell me, uh, you didn't have access to the uh, computers of the DNC. Uh, uh, why was that? Oh, we were, never, we were never given access. We were never given. Well, hello. <laughs> what do you need? Oh, yeah. All you need is a little warrant or a little letter. You know, the FBI doesn't, doesn't hesitate from invading the, the homes of some of my NSA friends or anything. So, he said, we weren't given access. Next question. Now, Mr. Comey, um, is it general practice uh, uh, not to seize the computers in such, such a case? Like when people are saying there's a war? Well, no. Uh, I have to admit that... Uh, uh, best practices um, would mean that, that we had physical access to the, to the computers, but, um, but we, were, we decided to rely on CrowdStrike, uh, which was a super top-rate uh, cyber organization, and uh, they did forensics, and we borrowed their forensics. <laughs> Anybody know about CrowdStrike? Run by run by a, a bunch of Russian-hating groups hired by Hillary Clinton with a very spotty record, actually a disastrous record of veracity in their conclusions in the past. So for some reason or other, James Comey didn't do that. Well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me be a little bit more orderly here. So we have June 12th, 
Assange says he's got the emails. Now, that gave, well, June 12th and July 25th, when the DNC convention was, I've done the subtraction, I think it's about three weeks, okay? Now, just imagine the situation at the DNC. Hillary sitting there with a bunch of her advisors, and they're saying, oh my God, Assange just got DNC emails, or my emails. Oh, <laughs> and we haven't even had our convention yet. What is Bernie going to say? What is Bernie going to say when he finds out what we did? My God, what are we going to do? And somebody says, I know what we do. We'll, we'll blame the Russians. Everybody's like, come on, it was the Russians. It was WikiLeaks. That's okay. We'll get a twofer here. We hate WikiLeaks as much as the Russians. We'll say that the Russians hacked and they gave the information to WikiLeaks. Oh, Hillary, anybody got any better ideas? <laughs> okay, we'll go with it. And that was it, folks. That's what they did starting after June 15th, all the way up to when, on June 22nd, three days before the convention, Julian Assange released the, the emails. Now, what happened? What was the, the headline in New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, when it became clear that these hacked emails had been published by WikiLeaks. Headlines were, why did Russia do this? Why did Russia, why are the Russians doing this? Why are the, nobody looked at the content of the emails. It was, a, it was a magnificent diversion of attention. You look at the record, nobody looked at what the emails said. It was all about, why did the Russians do this? Why, who, who the, so it worked like a charm, it worked like a charm. And I had a chance to talk, well, to hear uh, Jennifer uh, Palmieri, who was uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, PR person, and she was bragging about going to the convention and shopping, going around in a golf cart to the various uh, uh, cable and uh, other news outlets and pushing this line under instruction that the Russians hacked. She said, and I have, I have it there, it's, it's, on, it's on tape, uh, C-SPAN has it. She said, you know, it was hard for me to believe the Russians would hack to help, to help defeat Hillary Clinton, and help Trump win, but we, we tried to sell it. And it was hard for anyone to believe, but when we got back to Brooklyn, Brooklyn was uh, Clinton headquarters, right? Then intelligence people started coming to us and filling in the blanks as to how the Russians hacked. And then we had journalists who had been briefed by intelligence people, and they told us more, and then, best of all, the Obama administration would start to confirm these stories. So then, we were off and running with this story. Now, it was so bad, John Brennan, the head of the CIA, was leaking like a sieve to the, to the New York Times and elsewhere. It was so bad that the Wall Street Journal complained they're not talking to us. They only talk to the Washington Post. They only talk to the New York Times. They're neglecting us. That's the, that's the Wall Street Journal saying. So that's what was going on then, okay? So the story was out, and it was clear in everybody's mind. Okay. Then there's the election. What was it, the 8th of, uh, or 7th? 7th? Yeah, okay, of November. And... Uh, a curious thing happened. Now, we all watch Rachel Maddow, of, of course, right? No. No, okay. <laughs> well, she, she had, <laughs> I see somebody going like this. <laughs> I, I share that sentiment. So she, uh, so she had uh, Chuck Schumer uh, as a special guest on the 3rd of January. And they were talking about Trump and how he was bad-mouthing the intelligence community. Can you imagine? Bad-mouthing his own intelligence community? <laughs> and so Chuck Schumer said, you know, I thought that Trump was a pretty smart businessman, and he knew, you know, what fights to pick, but he's done something very, very stupid. And Rachel says, oh, what would that be, Chuck? And he says, well, he says, he's taken on the intelligence community, and they have six ways to Sunday to get back at you. 
very foolish thing to do. Now, Rachel, if she was a real interviewer, she would have said, Senator, are you saying that the President of the United States or the President-elect should be afraid of the intelligence community? And that's, of course, exactly what he was saying. And I'm sorry to tell you that's true, because that is the reality. Uh, Trump's own freedom of flexibility, is his freedom to do things he wants, is tightly circumscribed by the intelligence community. And that is the Donnybrook that's in, in process right now. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Anyhow, that was Chuck Schumer on the 3rd of January. Now, on the 5th of January, um, President Obama, in his last few weeks in office, this is 17 now, it's 2017, he was briefed by uh, NSA, CIA, and the FBI that had done this very poor excuse for an intelligence assessment, adducing no real evidence, but saying that Putin himself had hacked, had ordered the hacking of the DNC. Okay? Now, he was briefed on that. And that's important to realize on the 5th. On the 6th, the president-elect uh, entertained James Comey, FBI, John Brennan, CIA, Admiral Rogers, uh, head of uh, NSA at the time, and James Clapper. Uh, James Clapper is a Russian expert studied the hands of Air Force generals down the line, okay? And he knows, and he said, quote, you know, Russian history shows that the Russians are almost genetically driven to be deceitful, to cheat. To I, I say that, that's a direct quote, almost genetically driven to be deceitful and to fool and blah, 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 blah. So, so this Jane Comey and his three, uh, uh, three members of the Magi there going in to see, uh, see uh, President-elect Trump. Now by prearrangement, by prearrangement, uh, James Comey lingered behind as the head of the FBI. And he said, now Mr. President, uh, I, uh, this is embarrassing uh, to tell you, but, but you should know uh, that we have this dossier which, uh, you know, it really shows some scurrilous things uh, about your visit to Moscow a couple of years ago and how prostitutes were involved and peeing on your bed. And we, we, now, it's not, that's not confirmed, not confirmed. But some of the press has it. And we just, just so you know, just so you know, that it's available. Now, that's an old trick, folks. That's an old trick. A president-elect is always subjected to this kind of we have this stuff on you, and we don't want it to get out, but just so you know, just so you know. And if I were Trump, I would have fired Comey. Right then, I would have said, Comey, go back, empty your desk, uh, and don't show your face in the FBI again, okay? Now, he would have had a couple weeks to do that. That's okay, because uh, Trump wasn't president yet. So, this was the ce celebrated steel dossier paid for, by whom? Hillary. Clinton's, yeah. Now, who else paid for the dossier? Who, who read the news today? It was confirmed that the FBI paid for the dossier. Yeah, paid this guy steal. So, are you getting the picture here a little bit? Uh, okay, so, so that will, that's what we have on the 6th of January. Now, what's really interesting is that this document that everybody crows about, this intelligence community assessment. The only accurate word in those, those three words is assessment. <laughs> Was it the intelligence community? No. Was it just three agencies of the intelligence community? No. What was it? It was hand-picked analysts from these three agencies, not the agencies themselves, hand-picked analysts. Who picked them? Who picked them? James Comey, for God's sake. Now, everyone knows in Washington that if you hand-pick the analysts, you hand-pick the conclusions, right? Okay. So 
there you had this, this document out that everyone is still crowing about. How can, how can Putin, how can Trump stand next to Putin and, and not believe U.S. intelligence? You know, this is terrible, you know? Oh, U.S. intelligence is always correct. Uh, except for before Iraq, and <laughs> except for a couple other things, all right? So, so this is necessary because on the 18th, so we, we're talking about the 5th of January, 2017, Obama's briefed on all this, okay? Now on the 18th, Obama gets up for his last press conference. And having read this and been briefed on this assessment that uh, Putin himself directed that uh, the DNC be hacked and the results be given, to, be given to WikiLeaks, what does Obama say? He says, and I quote, the conclusions of the intelligence community with respect to how Russian hacking got to WikiLeaks are inconclusive, period, end quote. Inconclusive conclusions. Wow. So why does Obama say that two days before he's going out of office? Because he's a lawyer. He wants to protect his dear dirty air, you know? The, the Russian hacking was, was bad enough because he knew, probably knew what the evidence was, like not much, but saying that it was given by the Russians to WikiLeaks. You know, we know, and I, I refer to my NSA colleagues, former, former NSA, uh, I probably already mentioned two of them were technical directors of NSA. Um, they know that it wasn't a hack because of the, the fact, number one, NSA collects everything. Now, you know, I, when Bill Binney first, Bill Binney, one of these former technical directors, when he told me that, I said, right, right, Bill, right, come on now. All emails, and all, come on, everything. He says, Ray, trust me. I couldn't say this before, but once Ed Snowden brought those slides out into Hong Kong, not only could I say it, but I could show exactly how it's done. I could show the trace routes that, that are implanted in the, in the network where they trace every single email. It's broken down into packets. The packets are reassembled. Those of you technical people realize what that means. We can trace exactly where it originated or where it ended up. And there ain't nothing. There ain't nothing on Russian hacking. So that's negative evidence, right? In other words, the argument would be, if NSA had that, certainly they would reveal that given all the controversy. But you know, Donald Rumsfeld, not my favorite philosopher, <laughs> but he did go to Princeton and he learned the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's pretty profound, think about that. Uh, the absence of evidence that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq doesn't mean they're not there. And so, so even, though, even though NSA collects it all, even though NSA has the Ecuadorian embassy in London surrounded what they call ironclad coverage, which means no signal gets in there, gets out of there with NSA getting it, right? Even though that was the case, we're not supposed to believe uh, that uh, there's, uh, the absence of evidence here means anything. So that was kind of hard. Now, Bill Binney and I did get into the Baltimore Sun, almost sort of a mainstream, a couple of op-eds there, but we couldn't get any other exposure for these views. But now we have forensics evidence. Now we have some forensic investigators, private ones, who were really interested in working with the metadata that surrounded one of the hacks. And we found out, as I said before, Guccifer 2.0 is a fraud. And we found out that this one celebrated event, which we have the, uh, the transfer rate for. In other words, uh, let me explain. It's sort of like, it's not, not hard to understand. Even a liberal arts guy like me can understand that after Bill Binney briefs me five times on it, okay? Now, um, liquid dynamics. You have a pipe. It has a capacity. You can't get stuff through that pipe that exceeds its capacity, right? 
So think of the network, think of the network, the internet that way. We know exactly what the capacity of the internet was on the 5th of July, uh, 2016. What was taken out of the DNC computers was taken out at three times, three times the capacity, the rate, so, so fast, bits, bytes, whatever you want to call them, that it could not have been a hack. It had to be a copy from the computer system onto one of those little thumb drives. And coincidentally, the rate was exactly the same as what a thumb drive can accommodate, okay? So this is physics. This is liquid dynamics. And we were able to prove that a year, well, on the 24th of July was this main, our main effort on that. And that was what got Bill Binney an interview with the head of the CIA at the time, uh, Pompeo. <laughs> Bill's friend, Bill is a very straight guy, right? So he, I said, how'd it go, Bill? He said, well, you know, he asked me what's going on. I said, well, your people are lying to you. <laughs> 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 and he says, well, what do you mean? He says, well, uh, you know, he explained the situation. And there were only two aides there, and I'm not sure how technically ep uh, adept they were. But then, uh, <laughs> then Pompeo says to him, um, uh, do you have a relationship with the FBI? And Bill says, well, sort of. Uh, eight years ago, they appeared at my house at 6 o'clock in the morning, guns drawn, shoved them in the face of my wife and, and, my, and my child, and got me in the shower. Shower curtain opens, there's a gun, look, putting at me. So, yeah, that's, that's the last time I had any dealings with the FBI. They knew that Bill Binney was not the source of a leak that they were investigating. They already knew who did it. Right? They just wanted to, they just wanted to make sure that nobody would, you know, that people know what happens to people like who could be the source. And three of Bill's colleagues were invaded the same morning at the same time. Three of two from NSA and one from uh, from the the House Intelligence Committee who is a straight person. Her name is Diane Roark, and she, uh, uh, she was distraught at, the, at what was going on at NSA, namely the collecting of information on all of us. You know. Now, let me just, people always say, well, I don't, you know, I have nothing to hide, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> if you catch a terrorist, I don't care if you're, well, <laughs> well that, that was prevalent when Ed Snowden came out and, this, and, and told us all what was going on. So we approached an old friend named Wolfgang Schmidt, who had, used to work for the Stasi, which is the East German Intelligence Service. Did any of you see uh, Das Leben der Ander, uh, the, the Lives of Others? It was a wonderful film. It was Academy Award winner, wasn't it? See if you can dig, fish it out, because it shows what the Stasi did, the incredible intrusiveness of their monitoring. So Wolfgang Schmidt is consulted by a couple of my friends, and they say, now Wolfgang, what do you say to people who, who say, oh, we have nothing to hide, uh, it uh, you know, doesn't matter to us? He says, this is incredibly naive. You don't get to decide what the government uses against you. The reason they collect this information is to use it against you in case they want to. Ah, this is the only reason, the only way to prevent it from being used against you is to prevent it from being collected in the first place. <laughs> there you go, you know? All of it's collected. We all have a little file in some of those, you know, those big, big storage. You know how much stuff you can fit on a little thumb drive. So. The only way to prevent it from being used against you is to prevent it from being collected in the first place, and we have a Fourth Amendment that is supposed to prevent that from happening. People like James Comey, people like Bob Mueller, people like General Hayden, people like John Brennan said, we don't care about the Fourth Amendment, we're gonna just monitor everyone. Now that was sort of an aside here. But I, I, want to, uh, I want to tell you that there are, there are great advantages to live 
near Washington, and we've been there 55 years now. We've been in our same house for 51 years. We couldn't possibly buy it now. <laughs> you know how that goes, right? Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, one advantage is that you get to go to meetings. You can even go to Hillary's and Podesta's old, uh, uh, old uh, think tank, uh, the what Center for American Progress or something like that. Okay, so that's what I do. I always go to those things, and if I can, if they'll recognize me. I, I raise my hand and ask a question. Well, we have queued up here um, a, uh, a two-minute uh, thing where I had already worn out my welcome the previous week, <laughs> and so they wouldn't recognize me when I raised my hand. So I went up after uh, Schiff, uh, Adam Schiff, representative from California, who is the, the lead on all this Russiagate, and I, I didn't know the camera was on. And I just sort of asked him a question. And you'll see it, ho I hope, if this thing works. And the whole deal was, uh, was that uh, he told me, well, he couldn't tell me the answer because it was, he just couldn't share it with me because it was classified, OK? And it's pretty telling. I was delighted to learn later that day that C-SPAN cameras were still on. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they even got the voice to it. So let's see if it works. Chief, my name is Ray McGovern. <clears throat> I served in CIA under seven presidents and nine directors. Well, thank you very much. We have a little alumni group called Veteran Intelligence oh, Professionals for Sanity. And we've been following this issue very closely. One of our members is the former technical director of NSA. I'm interested in one week ago, when the president said this, I don't want to misquote him, the conclusions of the intelligence community with respect to Russian hacking were not conclusive regarding WikiLeaks. In other words, there's a big gap between alleged Russian hacking and WikiLeaks. The intelligence community does not know how or if that information, to the degree it exists, got to WikiLeaks. Now, you assert as flat fact that Russia did this. Uh, do you know more than Obama? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I would never claim to know more than Obama. I think well, he's no, a brilliant man. It's a very serious no, question. No, it, it, it's a serious question. Um, I uh, have every confidence in the intelligence of the Russian hacking of both the DNC uh, as well as John Podesta. James Clapper is a convicted... You ask me a question, do you, want, do you want to hear sure. the answer? I will. Um, and uh, while I can't go into the classified information, I have every confidence that the Russians uh, used WikiLeaks, uh, whether Julian Assange was a knowing participant or, as the Russians would describe, a useful idiot. Uh, uh, that we will hopefully find out, but um, but I don't have any question in the conclusions that the intelligence. Uh, you have every speech. confidence, but no evidence. Is that right? Uh, no, I can't share the evidence with you. Yeah, Congressman. That, I'm Paul that's Joy, bogus. I'm former uh, that's bogus. Director of Security Center Intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, we always refer to it as the SSCI, the intelligence. <laughs> so he has every confidence, but no no evidence. Yeah. It's so nice to know that uh, these politicians have 100% confidence in the intelligence community. I mean, I feel so safe. <laughs> now, I think while this is still working, I'm going to show you one, one other short clip. Just to introduce it, there's one congressman. His name is um, Devin Nunes. Uh, he comes from the Central Valley of California. Now, um, I have to tell you, that I know something about him because I met him about nine or ten years ago. He was the only congressperson, the only U.S. official, that had the guts to give an award to one of the survivors of the USS Liberty. One of the people working for him, Terry Halbergier, was the sailor when the Israelis were attacking the U.S. Liberty. Poured napalm all over the deck shot out the, all the active radars that were working. He went up to uh, Captain McGonagall and he said, Captain, he was from Texas, 
I think I can make that. You know that 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 antenna we couldn't get to work before, but the Israelis haven't knocked that out. So I think I can connect that. And McGonagall said, "Right. What are you going to swim across that napalm? What are you going to do?" Tell you, no. I don't. He says, "Sir, I'd like to try. I request permission. Permission granted." He went out with some bailing wire. You do, you know, you know how to do those things and. We, in infantry, we call that a field expedient, right? Well, uh, Terry Halpert, he knew how to do this. He connected the wire, they got an SOS out, and that's the only reason that only 34 people were killed by the Israelis that day, not the whole shipload of almost 300. They broke off the attack because they inter intercepted the SOS. Now, Devin Nunes had Terry Halpert J working for him, and he heard about all this, and so he petitioned the Navy to give Terry the Silver Cross, which I'm told is the second highest, right, right underneath the Medal of Honor. And when I heard that, I'm very friendly with a lot of the Liberty survivors. You want to you see what PTSD looks like, folks? Talk to the Liberty survivors for lots of reasons. Anyhow, I went out there in the next plane, and I got there just for the ceremony, modest ceremony, right in Nunes' office there in Visalia, uh, in the Central Valley. And uh, there was a couple press around, no big deal. Uh, and Terry was awarded. And they, the press was saying, can you show us your award? He pulled up his shirt, the, the shrapnel thing, you, you wouldn't believe. Anyhow, he got that award. I thought that was courageous. You know, you can be cynical and say, well, there aren't too many Israelis living in the century, Central Valley of California. But still, you know, he's a congressman and he, he faced into that. Now, I never thought that he'd re reappear in this incarnation, but he's now head of the Intelligence Committee in the House. And together with two other committee chairs, seem to be doing uh, a, a job that is quite uncommon in, uh, in Washington. You see, the, the oversight committees have the idea that oversight is oversight, uh, not oversight. So what Nunes is doing is holding people's feet to the fire. Now he had a, uh, he, I think he arranges these interviews. He had one interview with Cheryl Atkinson, who was a very good reporter. And I'm sure, you know, they rehearsed it. And he said, now you ask me, you ask me if these folks are guilty, these fo folks who thought Hillary was going to win and took, uh, took great liberties with the law, ask me uh, if they should be put on trial. Oh, wow. Now, I have never seen any House Committee chairman, uh, Intelligence Committee chairman, uh, say that you know anybody who lied or did this kind of s subterranean thing should be put on trial. So let me see if I can get this thing to work here. And if I can, you are in for a treat, but it's only one minute. Now, this starts, uh, I only want you to listen to a minute and a half of it, but she is interviewing him about the progress of the investigation this is February 18th of this year, and uh, she asks him the question, and this is the one that people need to be aware of. Ready? FBI on trial, and to put special counsel Bob Mueller's investigation on trial. Yeah, well, FISA abuse has nothing to do with, with the Mueller investigation. Uh, as it relates to Department of Justice and the FBI, if they need to be put on trial, we will put them on trial. The reason that Congress exists is to oversee these agencies that we created. DOJ and FBI are not above the law. Congress created them, we oversee them, and we fund them. And if they're committing abuse for a secret court, getting warrants on American citizens, you're darn right that we're going to put them on trial. What would you say is the takeaway? I think people are just starting to learn now what really happened because as we peel more and more of this back, I think more and more Americans get educated and I think they're going to demand that, that changes are made. Friday, Special Counsel Mueller announced indictments against a number of Russians. You don't know what a success I, I feel at having been able to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Doesn't matter what else I say here. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be quick in, in finishing up here. Um, in, in December of last year, in December of last year, Russiagate migrated into 
FBI gate. The people that Nunes is referring to here are the heads of the FBI, the CIA, the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, a couple of her deputies, all of whom signed these FISA warrants based on information paid for by Hillary Clinton, and now we know also paid for by the FBI. My God. <laughs> so that's how serious it is. And what I'm trying to say here is that uh, um, the hacking stuff, you know, what we have now is evidence uh, that, well, how, how many people know about the, uh, the Lisa Page, uh, Peter Strzok text message exchanges? Oh, wow, okay. Well, okay, so you need to know where to get information about these things, okay? Long story short, Peter Strzok and his paramour, Lisa Page, Peter Strzok was the second highest counterintelligence official in the FBI, and Lisa Page was a very high, highly paid attorney working for the deputy director of the FBI, McCabe. And they had this affair going where they exchanged several hundred messages a day. It's amazing, okay? And uh, early on, they were very critical of Hillary Clinton. I'm, I'm sorry, they're very... Uh, Peter Strzok at one point says, Hillary should win one million to nothing, right? And Lisa says, yes, she should win one million to nothing. Next one, he says, congratulations on a woman uh, running for president. High time. And she says, oh, that's so cute. These are direct things, okay? Now, she says early on, now, Peter, uh, we, we, we feel, feel free to share our views about uh, Trump and so forth uh, and our support for Hillary because this can't be, uh, can't be collected, right? This is secure, the, these FBI phones. And I said, oh, no problem. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> God, here's the deputy head of, of counterintelligence of the FBI. Doesn't realize that the NSA and everybody else can easily collect stuff from a, from a bureau phone, right? Okay. I mean, he must have... You know, they have briefings like, uh, what does NSA collect, or, or are our FBI phones secure from any, any monitoring? But he must have, well, I guess during that briefing he was, he was texting uh, Lisa Page, because he wasn't, wasn't patient, paying him very good attention, see? So that's how it went. Now, they gave, now, what happened was, and this is really interesting, because the Inspector General of the Justice Department which has purview over the FBI as well, the Inspector General does, have found these messages as a, resent, as a result of the Mueller investigation and all this kind of stuff. And they came out in the open December, December of last year. We had them, all the things I just mentioned. But they didn't share these messages. Well, Lisa Page says, he's not gonna win, is he? He's not gonna win. And Peter said, no, no, he never win. We will stop it. Quote, we will stop it. The last thing I'll mention from this exchange is that uh, uh, after he supervised the investigation of Hillary Clinton and her emails, he was asked to join Mueller's operation and did join Mueller's operation. But in that interim period, he's talking with Lisa, and Lisa says, you're gonna, are you gonna join the, the Mueller operation to, to, to get to the bottom of Russiagate? And he says, yeah, I don't want to. I mean, there's no there there. How many of you know that, that Peter Strzok said that? Three. You guys read the New York Times. <laughs> or the Seattle Times. You didn't know that Peter Strzok said that there's no there there? You've got to read raymcgovern.com. If you don't get it, you don't get it. <laughs> no, really, out there on the web, you can find all kinds of good stuff. My, my son runs my website from L.A., and he's really angry when I forget to mention it. Okay, so I mentioned it. Now, consortiumnews.com is another really, really good website. Uh, so you can get this information, but I am really, I mean, I have to say that only three or four people knew about Peter Strzok saying there's no there there. Well, 
That's the, that's the message, folks. He knew. He had looked into all this stuff by this time, and he knew that there was no there there. <sighs> wow. Well, let me finish up here. Well, let me just finish with this. Um, these telltale signs, uh, the ostensible hack, uh, which had this metadata attached to it, uh, and had the Cyrillic, and had the name of the uh, name and patronymic of Felix Simonovich, the first head of the Cheka, they called in those days the KGB for, for, forerunner. Um, hmm. So, who else might have done that? Huh. Well, you know why they hate Julian Assange? Because you wouldn't know this if you read the New York Times. But on the 31st of March, he released documentation, authentic CIA memos and emails, showing that CIA had developed a cyber tool which allows the new CIA directorate. Now, I, when I say directorate, that means several thousand people. OK, there were only three directorates when I was there. Now there are four. Cyber warfare is the fourth, OK? Which allows the CIA to hack into a system, or a computer, or a server, disguise who hacked in, and leave telltale signs giving the responsibility to somebody, somebody else. Whoa. Now that was revealed by WikiLeaks on the 31st of March. Immediately, the New York Times, as is as its launch these days, contacted the CIA or the, or the White House. Should we should we publish that? No, no, don't publish that. Unfortunately, or fortunately, um, Ellen Nakashima from the Washington Post didn't get the memo. <laughs> she didn't get the memo, so she published a really good story: a, a, a CIA secret uh, capabilities to hack in. Dis disclosed, okay? And she showed in her article that they work in five languages, right? Chinese, Korean, Persian, uh, Arabic, and Russian. Cyrillic, okay? And she, she didn't indicate this, but the, inf the original information, which nobody disputes, this is direct from the CIA, okay? Uh, that it was used during 2016. Now, uh, we, we make a real sharp distinction here, Bob, uh, Bill, Binney, and I. What we said about forensics is science, right? It's physics, okay? We can prove it. Now, we can't prove that it was John Brennan. We can't prove that it was the CIA cyber hackers that hacked in and left these telltale signs, but we think it's a likely possibility, okay? And that's why you have them coming after Julian Assange full bore. Two weeks after that revelation, Pompeo got up and he said, Julian Assange is a demon. I, I didn't used to believe in demons, you know. But he's a, he believes in demons, apparently. He's a demon and he's running a non-state hostile intelligence service. Now you know that Julian Assange has been held incommunicado since the late March. He's in bad health. They're out to get him. And they're out to get him because he has this way of getting authentic CIA documents. Again, nobody disputes the authenticity of this. Nobody knows about it, really. Judging from the few people who knew about uh, what they call Vault 7, it's marble framework. That's what they call this particular tool. So, you know, it's really pretty bad because what we have now is the deep state. And I use the, t the term advisedly. There is a deep state. And when you look at the FBI, you look at the CIA, to a lesser extent the NSA, uh, you look now at the Justice Department. They have a lot to protect themselves against because they thought Hillary's going to win. Comey has said that. 
And that explains, pure and simple, why they thought they could take extracurricular, extra legal measures to make sure she won and to make sure Trump lost and after the election to use this information to the degree they could to blacken Trump so he can't reach out to Russia. And that's another story. Uh, a lot of people think it makes good sense to have a decent relationship with Russia, but not what Pope Francis called the blood-soaked arms traders, okay? And that's a big, big lobby. What we have now is what Ike, uh, Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. What we have now is the military-industrial congressional intelligence media media complex. It all fits together, folks. And we don't know half of what's going on. Not even you who are progressive and keep up on these things. Most of you didn't know about Marble Framework and the likelihood, as Bill Binney and I see it, there was a CIA that hacked in on the 5th of, 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 uh, of, Feb of July uh, 2016 and left these telltale signs. So um, it's pretty serious. Uh, now, the question really, and I'll finish with this, is you saw Devin Nunes. He threw down the gauntlet, didn't he? He said, if they're guilty, they're going to go to trial. Whoa. This is big. Loretta Lynch going to jail? James Comey? Liar that he is? Bob Mueller? Uh, John Brennan? So what I'd like to just leave with you is the thought that unless we know about what's going on, these guys are going to prevail. They always do. Schumer was right. They have six ways from Sunday. They get them, okay? So to the degree you become informed a little bit better and you find out what Nunes is really after and whether you think he's honest or not, you know, I find myself really bizarrely sympathetic to his genuine efforts, in my view, to get to the bottom of this. And uh, the Democrats are trying to, I think in a quixotic way, trying to make a big deal out of this because last thing I'll say, very last thing is, in the little brochure, I indicated what is taking Bob Mueller so long? And the answer is, because there's no there there. Thank you very much.